Joining us now here on In the Circle, she's been an original. She's been coming on this show since year one of this show. Uh, and this is our ninth year, so this has got to be at least your ninth appearance on the show, at least for season previews, uh, yeah. and not even counting other op- uh, possibilities during postseason. But she's in her 16th season at Florida State, a national champion head coach, and now newly NFCA inductee Hall of Famer head coach Lonnie Alameda. I've never called you a Hall of Famer officially <laughs> all these times you've come on the show, but it's it's warranted now. How are you doing, Coach? I'm doing great. Thanks, Eric, for having me. And if we're talking nine years of me being here, it's nine years of you being all into softball, which is super cool. And uh, we were just talking about you as a staff earlier today. Just It's always special to have people that love our sport and have grown our sport with us. So thank you for being a part of it. And it's good to be here. Yeah, we both feel you, know, you got to Florida State in 2009. I got into softball in 07. This pod started around 15. So you know, it all connects. Yeah. I'm going to open with a topic you hate talking about all these years yeah. I've had you on. And that is talking about you. Because yeah. you were honored in December in Louisville at the NFCA convention. You got inducted into the NFCA Hall of Fame. You've had mm-hmm. now a little time to think about and digest that experience. What was that like and what does that mean to you to have your peers, your colleagues, all really give you the ultimate respect mm-hmm. by in- putting you in the Hall of Fame? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an honor. You know, I think um, – Probably the the toughest thing is to think about writing a speech. Um, you know, I, I think as softball coaches, you can go up there and wing softball quite easily. Um, but then when you have to try to wing a timed speech and try to cover all aspects of why you're up there uh, was really daunting and emotional. Honestly, I, you know, I tapped into my feelings a lot when you're talking about your journey and, you know, your family and how it all started. So Um, so I think as it, you know, it trickled down and the months went by and I really thought about what hall of fame meant and the journey and just the game of softball and how far it's grown. Um, it was a super cool night and I didn't know what to expect. Um, but really, really enjoyed it. Um, had some cool inductees along with me. Um, so that made it fun too, because you're at this head table with, you know, people that are celebrating their journeys too. And so, um, so yeah, really special night and a lot of fun to be part of. I'll tell you the one thing I didn't realize would be so cool is, they line up all the Hall of Famers and you're like the last one to be announced because you're being inducted <laughs> and you're going through the line and it's like you're getting hugs of people welcoming you into this club, right? And so um, didn't really expect that to be as cool as it was. And, you know, to have Mike Candrea and Hutch and, you know, of course, Coach Graff, who's here all the time, but she's hugging you at a different level there, you know, like how yeah, you made it to this really cool group, you know, so that was pretty special. But you you had a year to prepare for this because this was announced a year in advance. But did it hit? Like, was there a moment when you got there? Did it hit you? Like, I mean, I, I'm just fascinated because you mm-hmm. know it's one thing you've gone to their previous years and it's just yep. business as usual. Maybe others you congratulate others, but all this attention is on you, and I know you hate that. You do not like that, <laughs> but yet you have no choice in the matter. Everybody's yep. going. This is all about you. So, what was that like? Did it hit you at a moment there? Like, whoa, this is this is big, unbelievable. Um, I don't know if it hit me so much as, um, you know, I was just really nervous about speaking and making sure I, I did it justice. You know, I I think that the speaking piece in front of your peers like that to, to speak about the honor itself was a lot. And so I was really nervous about that piece. And, um, uh, you know, I think for me, just to be able to, afterwards, we had a little get together with a lot of people that were, you know, close to me and my journey and, um, they were all able to kind of speak to what this journey has meant to them, which I've been a part of, softball has been a part of, and we've been a part of, and like how we all came together and to hear a, a Maggie and a Marissa and a Brit, uh, Kendall Fern, like all these cool people, T-Will even, you know, Rafter, Ellie to get up there and speak um, and just our small circle, like really meant a lot. And, uh, you know, we had some student managers there, like it was just, it was super special. So I think the intimacy of of the sport and how this opportunity has allowed me to affect people in their journey also has been really cool. And it's, it's awkward because you probably have so many people to thank, right? There's so many people that have impacted you, but you don't have time to remain all of them. Like (laughs) it's hard enough doing that just on the people during your time at Florida state. That's not even counting your times with the Canadian national team, your time as an assistant at Stanford or as all the other places in the pro level. And yet you have people like what blew me away 
was the videos with some of your former players and, mm-hmm. and, and people making the video and how much you meant to them. Mm-hmm. What did that mean to you to have people co- really go out of their way to let you know that they're excited that you're getting in, but that you've meant a lot to them in their lives? Yeah. Um, I'm so lucky, Eric, that like you can kind of see my office right now, but like if you look at my office, like there's mementos and nuggets of so many people been part of this program. And um, it wasn't just that moment that thanks and hugs and love's been shared for the game and how it's grown people in their journey. And so, um, and I'm still in touch with a lot of those people. So yes, it's special to hear. And I didn't watch any of the videos until afterwards because I knew how emotional I'd be <laughs> beforehand. Um, so I know that Tim and our department put together some really cool stuff that I didn't watch till later because I wanted to make sure my emotions were in check during the time. But I, you know, I definitely, um, sit in this office and I conversate a lot with players, former players and managers. And so, um, I know that there's a special spot for this place and a lot of people's hearts, but it's because they gave to this place just as much as I'm giving to it. So, um, so yes, it's great to hear, but I'm so happy that they're comfortable enough to be genuine, to get the most out of the experience. And that takes a lot of leap of faith and trust in, in me and the program. That sounds like advice you might give uh, Tim Walton and future inductees. Like, don't watch <laughs> these videos. Is yeah. that the advice you're going to give to Tim next year and future inductees? Yeah, it's funny. I texted Tim afterwards, you know, just the, like last year at you know midnight, I got a text from a lot of people like you're in the Hall of Fame. And, um, you know, I was fortunate, like, wow, Tim, congrats. So cool. Like, here's some things I just learned. <laughs> so uh, I did share a little bit, but you know, I, again, it's everyone's personal journey and they're going to do it differently. And I know he's got incredible people that love um, everything he's done for the university of Florida and for the game of softball. And he'll have the same experience, but yeah, really, really cool. Connie's amazing what she's done at Texas and in her time. And um, so I, I just think it's pretty, pretty cool and special. If I would have run into you in 2009, when you arrived in Tallahassee and I would have told you, that the next 15 years, the next 16 seasons would play out like it did, which Mm. would include you being inducted to the Hall of Fame. What would have been 2009 Lonnie's reaction? Mm. Um, I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) I hope what you're saying is true because I'm coming here for all those same reasons, you know? And um, yeah, I I think uh, just, yeah, I can think of special moments, turning points. I mean, Lacey Waldrop was one of them. You know, I think there was a turning point of Lacey, like, do you want to be a great pitcher or not? And she chose to be a great pitcher and she chose to do the hard work. And that put us on the map just as much as Megan King and Jessica Burroughs. You know, there's certain moments, you know, Jesse Warren, there's certain moments that people grow up and do things that, you know, have you had the chance to put it on the map? And Um, You know, those are the names, but it takes every team, every team has put something into this program to be the foundation of it continuing to grow. And, um, you know, in our conference room, I have our every year's poster in there and every player is on the poster because every player matters, you know, and and I hope they feel that when they come here, there'll be a name that is an all American or a name that makes the headlines, but it's definitely that team that is part of the building blocks of continuing it to grow. So um so yeah I would say man Eric I hope you're right and more and more I get into this every player feels a special part of it and that's what makes the event so special well and I think what's unique and I've told coach Walton this too like you know obviously when you think of softball in the state of Florida which obviously I've been to Florida you're in Florida you know coach Graff it starts with coach Graff and coach Joyce what they did help put softball on the map in the division one level you know that as well as anybody following coach Graff but I think you Coach Warren, I've said this is like a golden age here with what you're doing at Florida State, what he's done at doing at Florida. You know, Coach Gillespie built the UCF program, and then Coach Ball Malone has taken it over and taken it to a different level at UCF. Coach Erickson at South Florida. I've said this is like a golden era in softball. I know you don't look at it because you're in the moment, but I mean, you—that's going to be a part of the 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 you know the resume there that when people talk about you is not the not only the impact on the field, but the impact of growing the game within the state, within the program. Yeah, I I agree. I think, um, you know, a lot of the barriers that we had is people were saying you couldn't do things in the ACC. So there was a lot of narrative down here that you could only go to one conference and be successful. And so our ability to bring another conference to that table and Cindy's ability to bring, you know, validity to another conference at that table in our state allows our players in our state to be able to um, be successful in softball in many different levels and many different programs. And that's outstanding for the growth of our game, 
for the Southeast, for the game of softball. And so um, I think we all do take pride in that for sure. No, it's incredible. It's, I hope people don't take it for granted. Uh, it's a lot of fun time. All right. I will stop asking you about yourself because I know you hate that. So you're off the hook there uh, for the rest of the show on that. Uh, we could go hours, but I know you don't want that. So we'll, let's talk about some other things instead. And I do want to ask you, though, about another big story in this offseason because that you're as passionate about the international game. And now we know softball officially is back in the Olympics in 2028 in Los Angeles. What is your reaction to that? And then, obviously, you've been involved with the Canadian national team. What is the impact on the Canadian national team moving forward? Yeah. Um, I mean, elation on the side that we're in it. Still frustration that we're not always in it. You know, I'd have to fight to get in every other four-year cycle. Like, I don't think people realize the hit that takes on building a program. So the United States is a little bit different because Team USA can pull from all the college programs. Where when you talk about different countries, they're getting funding to only fund their ability to compete at that level. They can't rely too much on the inter on the college scene. Where Canada, we can, you know, we have a lot of our players playing in in the United States, but um, there's a lot of other countries, um, maybe a Brazil or a Great Britain or places that only rely on that funding to travel their national teams to play. And if they're skipping a four-year cycle, that funding goes away and they don't get to continue to develop their programs. So in order for international softball to elite high-level status, they have to have other teams be able to compete at that to keep us in the games. And I don't think people realize that at times is when we, we leave for a couple of years, funding goes down, and then the growth of players is tough. The challenge right now, too, is 2028 is, you know, couple years away and you've got some players in the system that will maybe tap out at age wise or some players that are younger right now will tap into age to be able to compete in the 28 or the 32s or whatever it is. So you've got to be really proactive in your development part to make sure that maybe some of those pitchers are, you know, able to play at that level. And so I think the vision of the coaches and the organizations and the countries is pretty big. Um, but, you know, I say off the top, just to answer it, outstanding, you know, you, you want softball to be in it, um, but to go in and out, in and out, that's, that's our next challenge is how can we be in it, stay in it? How can we all contribute to all the world playing softball at a good level? So we want it there all the time. So now bat companies, glove companies, everyone can support and stay in that support. Um, and I think then is the pro leagues that, you know, you just really keep raising it all around. So um, but yeah, I, I'm really excited for team Canada. I think they've done some really good stuff and, um, I love being a part of the international game and as much as I can help it grow, I want to be there. Yeah. I know Jen Salling told me that funding, that's the underrated thing that people forget is when you're not in the Olympics, it affects fundings on these other countries, et cetera. It's why it's important. Well, that's why there's a lot of optimism with the, the Olympic cycle with the United States hosting in 28 and then Brisbane in 2032 australia a big softball country that maybe softball could stick for at least those two guaranteed olympics and help and yeah. move forward from there i know michelle smith when i've had her on the biggest thing she said is we got to grow it in europe because that's always been a roadblock yeah uh, on that you've you've traveled over yeah. the year have you do you see progress is there optimism is you see that as you've seen growth yeah. Uh, you know, I think the one thing I'm starting to see a lot more is there's pride and respect for some really good collegiate players playing for their countries. You know, I look at Pion Castelli and some of them that have played here that can play at a high level and they do well in the pro leagues and they go play for their country. Italy's great. And she adds respect and depth to her country. And we get more of that. I mean, I've been watching a lot of like soccer and world cup stuff, you know, and you look at a lot of those players that play professionally, but they go play for their countries and they make their countries better. And if we can continue to work on building each country and, and the pride of these players going back and playing for their countries, then it raises the game for everybody for sure. So, um, so that's one thing I've seen a, a little bit of a change at, you know, and um, you know, of course the USA dominates cause you know, we're really, we've got really talented players here. And I think Japan does a really good job of, developing continue to develop their pro league to support their national team i do think the funding like jenny talks about like i think the funding is truly important we should fund our usa player players better we need to fund you know uh, canada like i mean we need to keep raising it so they can train year-round and they could do the things to take the game to the next level and there's parity i think that let's let you know you yeah. know the last olympics as you know in tokyo i mean a couple of swings here and there and you canada could have won the gold there yeah. or played for the gold medal 
Uh, you know, you've got obviously United States, you got Japan, which maybe has been the model. They've had the successful pro league yeah. uh, and development there that maybe I think some people have mentioned that maybe that's the blueprint. Australia, yeah. we've talked about, uh, etc. cetera, uh, there. Uh, so there's parity because it used to be, yeah. well, it's a one sided why we're here. That's not the case anymore. And I think that yeah. also has to be relayed out that there's parity and it's a, an exciting tournament. Yeah, for sure. You're right. Speaking of tournaments, let's talk about your program coming off fresh. Another Women's College World Series appearance got to the National Championship Series. Before we talk about this year, I know you like to look back at the year before and dissect it all before moving forward to the next team. So when when you this offseason, when you look back at last year, what what comes to mind for you that you want to kind of move forward here to for this team? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's two things to look at. One is the growth of our game. The game is getting so much better. Uh, we are playing softball at a pretty high level across the board, and it doesn't matter if it's power five or mid-majors. There's some really good coaches out there. Strategies become a big part of it. Matchups are becoming a big part of it. Things that we sprinkled in are now becoming mainstream, which is making the game a lot better and, and way more fun. Um, and then, you know, when I look at our team, um, you know, we really tried to do things a little bit different, kind of the pitching, um, area where we're at just trying to manage innings, manage time, manage development, um, and really stuck to it, you know? And, and I think that having Kat be able to take a back seat in the beginning of the season to end up being a little stronger towards the end of the season, um, played out well for us and, um, you know, was, was a pretty big strategy in the beginning, but then ended up working for us, which was kind of fun, but you know, it was really cool on her part. And I'm going to say, it's just, you know, Kat really took a very mature leadership role and saying, do what's best for the team. It's not about me. And um, it raised everybody up and definitely raised the pitching staff up. And it it was really awesome on that sense. Um, I think offensively, you know, we, we got into um, really understanding how to play as as a squad mid season, Um, and sometimes you don't know when that's going to show up, you know, you've got to figure out how to play as a team. And that's something we addressed and had really good mid season conversations as a coaching staff, as a team to make that switch, to be able to, how to be an offensive unit and how to be a defensive unit. And, um, you know, taking a little bit of that mindset into this fall when we trained, um, knowing that we're down a little bit experience, but it doesn't mean that we can change, take those lessons from last year and implement them. We're just going to have to give some some growing pains this year as we go into maybe a little more freshman roles versus veteran roles, a Josie Muffley versus an Issa Torres role. So, um, so yeah, so we're, we're pretty excited about that part. You mentioned it uh, and and getting Kat to buy into, you know, limiting her pitches early in the, in the deal. I've had numerous coaches on the show, on the record and even off record have told me that one of the things they admire about you is when they see your pitching staffs, they're bought in to their roles to the point where you've got them, where they will, they'll do whatever it takes to win, which is not easy in today's day and age where you have pitching staffs, but now you have players that they want to know why I should do this role. Whereas maybe 10 years ago, you told them, Hey, you got to do this. And okay, no, no, no questions asked, but now players want to know why they have this specific role. You have to tell, sell them in a way why this is a good thing for them and the team. How do you do that as a coach? Yeah, that's the secret sauce. That's episode 27. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, Let's see, Eric. I think um, it's a bit of our system here. So um, anyone that comes into our program understands, start to understand how we work as a battery, you know, and you get upperclassmen speaking to the younger ones. And this is how we do things. So it's a bit of our system, number one. Number two is... um, I'm a big educator, so it is the Gen Z world. They want to know why. Um, So I'm going to educate them on what they do well, what we can do better at, how we manage games, what the game needs from us in management, like how you pitch to hitters, how we pitch to hitters in certain situations when we're up by runs, down by runs. Like I'm educating them along the way. So I'm hoping by the time Kat Sandercock can do her own thing. She knows how to scout. She knows how to do all that because she put her time in here to understand that. So then there's just no butting heads because you are in the know. I'm very transparent. And that starts from the beginning with freshmen. So by the time you become a junior, you're pretty much your own pitching coach doing your own thing. And then we're working on the freshmen again. So I think knowledge is the biggest thing. And I'm willing to open the books in the room and like, here it is. Like, I'm not hiding anything from anyone because the more you know about yourself, 
then it's easier to grow. But if you don't really dive into knowing who you are, then it's hard to grow. And you're just trying to prove to everybody what you are. But like, I think the understanding piece is very important. And then you go do what you do, what you're capable of doing. Let's go do it. And let's keep building on that. And so I think that's been a lot of fun, kind of that that knowledge seeking mindset, they're very growth mindset pitchers and, and they want to, they want to compete, but they also want to keep learning and getting better. A lot of your local media, as you get to with them closer to the seas, are going to ask you about, you know, Catherine Sandercock, not having her, not having a Mac Leonard who helped on the pitching staff as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, tons. And, but we've talked about it. You don't replace those players, but it creates that next opportunity. You pass the baton to the next person. That's been yeah. what you've built, especially on the pitching staff. My first question is, I'm more curious. What is next for Kat? What is next for her? Because I think she needs to be in that conversation among the great Seminole pitchers. She's in that conversation with the Megan Kings, the Burroughs, the Waldrips. I mean, the list is lengthy, so I'm going to leave people out. So I apologize in advance. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, over here. what is next for her? I'm curious. Will she continue to play? Is that what she wants to do? What's next for her? Yeah, her ultimate goal um, was to play softball as long as she could. She loves it. She wanted to play in Japan. She wanted to play in USA as much as she could. Um, she wanted to play pro. Like uh, everything that she wanted happened. Like she is playing in Japan. She's playing for AU. She's she's touring the world. She's meeting great people. She just absolutely loves competition and she loves pitching. Like so. Um, so with her ability, her last two summers here, she trained with a mindset to be better and um, more physically in shape. And she was more physically in shape and she was better. And she earned herself a chance to make a professional debut in Japan and do the thing she's doing. So she's living her dream. I mean, not many people get to do that, you know, in life. And I just think that's super cool. And she's going to do it till she can't. And then she wants to be a coach. She wants to be a pitching coach and she will be a great one when she gets a chance to do that. So I'm proud of her for that, you know, and, and you're right. Like next man up, um, Kat had that mindset when she was here. Megan King was that to her. Kylie Hansen was that to like Kaylin Arnold. I've had so many great pitchers are like, man, I'm not going to be here forever. Let me tell you how, you know, I can help you. And that was Kat's senior year. Like, Hey, Reed, you know, I know what you're thinking right now. And I was thinking that as a freshman, but this is what it's like, you know? And like just planting the seeds to eventually maybe McKenna's junior year. She'd be like, man, I remember Kat talking about that. Right. Like, like there's just really good moments of like, ah, Megan did that to me. And now I'm going to do that to somebody else to help it grow. And so I think McKenna's going to have, you know, a, a challenging time this year because people have seen her and they know that she's probably the name on the board that people know for Florida State, Florida State softball right now. But you look at Emma Wilson, who has had great experience, just hadn't had the opportunity. Allison Royalty, great experience, hasn't had the opportunity. You know, I, I look at our freshmen and, you know, and Danley, what she's doing coming in, she doesn't know what's ahead of her, but she's so excited about doing it, you know? So I think that when you look at certain moments right now, we're going to have some growing moments in the circle, 100%. But the way they're already looking at it, the narrative is like what you just said is like, oh, we don't have these people, but they don't know who we do have. And I think that's what they're excited about is they're going to unite. Um, you know, we got freshman and Mimi Good, and a lot of people don't know about it. She's going to unite with this group of sisters to go out and try to get something done. And uh, they're pretty excited about those opportunities. You told me it over the years. There are some years where your pitching staff, there's an established leader, yeah. either vocally or leads by example. And even if they're not necessarily the ace, necessarily, quote unquote, right? Their example. But then you've also told me there's some years where that it takes a while to develop during the season. Where do you feel you're at from that standpoint with the pitching staff? Do you think you have leaders established or is that still to be determined? Um, I think it's a to be determined thing because uh, we are so young. Like we had a really good fall. We had we had a really good, tough at times, tough conversations, um, really trying to figure ourselves out. Really good fall. Really excited about it. Now we're ready for the challenges of February. So when we get to the end of February and we're like, man, like, you know, we went out to war and some battles. We came back, you know, bandaged ourselves up, got some different strategies, gone out again. Now you get to the end of February and you're like, all right, we've been in it. Who are the voices that are going to raise up and what are we going to fall back on? So we'll fall back on our fall training and then we're going to be led by who wants to be about it. And that's when we start to figure out who our real warriors are. And uh, that's what I get most excited about. And I think we have in the circle. I think royalty is one of them. I, I think she's a she's a warrior and she doesn't care who gets the job done, but she will definitely raise her hand to be a part of it. Um, so, you know, I really love what she's brought to us. Um, and I love all our freshmen have now found a voice 
the game doesn't know they're freshmen, but they they put themselves in that narrative. And I think when we start getting the battles, they'll start to show up. And so I'm excited to see, you know, what does Harding do for us? What does Dev do for us as a leader? You know, Mudge, like she's got a voice. Edenfield, she's got a voice. But like we are a different team that by the end of February is going to figure out how to rise up and get after it. You've had teams where, you know, the offense was young or wasn't clicking. So your pitching and defense pick up the slack. Uh, I think of 2021, for example, the pitching then and the offense finally and you figured yeah. it out. You made the run. Does it feel like this year maybe the offense early on maybe picks mm. up some of that slack and helps uh, I- I- until the pitching sorts itself out? Because you have, you mentioned the names. You've got yeah. so many players coming back, which has got to make Coach Wilson very excited yeah. to know he's got <laughs> players on the lineup card he's familiar with, like the Flaherty's. Enfield's a mudge. I mean, these are names that anybody that's followed your program knows probably by heart by now. Yeah. Is that is that part of it this year early on? Did, if from that stat you're talking about leadership there? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I, I mean, I think it's always really hard to like you look at teams and I even look at teams last year who was returning and you expect we, we expect our offense to kick off and be fine, you know, like you expect that because they have the experience and that you rely on. But the reality is we're just we're just a new team coming into this year and we need to do the things we're capable of doing. So we will keep pushing the buttons of the offense, but we got to keep pushing the buttons of the defense and keep pushing the buttons of the pitching. So if we always come back after a game and be like, wow, we're we're still doing okay here in our process offensively, probably could be a little better here defensively process wise and get better, you know, versus like, oh, offense, keep carrying us, we'll get better. Like always be about the process, process, process and consistency and then we can keep our head above water and make those adjustments. And so, um, yeah, I would say, you know, hey, yeah, we've got kids that have been in the battles before, but it's still about how we process and get better every game. Um, you know, the more you're in the game, the more you expect from yourself, the more you're in the game, more people know. So every level becomes a little bit more of a challenge. And uh, those things still have to be met with processes and trust. And so uh, I think they're ready for that. But so are we being young in the circle. So are we being freshman new? Like we're all ready for our processes to grow in the game right now muffley was a kid that really impacted your team beyond the box score which she provided to the team especially defensively at the shortstop position how do you don't how do you what do you see there as far as the defensive side of things especially up the middle yeah um i mean when you talk about middle infielders playing as a unit Devin, josie i mean just because you've been in it for so long together um, they were pretty tight, you know, and, and I, I loved watching them towards the last month and a half of the season last year, just, just move as one, you know, they would lock eyes with me and pitch calling and they were already moving as one. They knew where to be, what to do. So fun. Um, Dev now has, you know, Issa Torres and Annie Potter over there at shortstop. Hartley's worked a little bit at short. Um, so now she's like, Hey, you want to be here? Hey, you want to be there? So it locks her up a little bit. Cause now she's coaching up, you know? So um, so I think, you know, um, so we're very athletic at short, you know, I know Josie was a highlight reel for sure. Um, but you know, she settled in and started getting comfortable playing the game at a high level too. There's one thing to be a highlight reel. There's another to be a high level softball player. And she started meeting the highlight reel with like high level softball IQ, which was super awesome to see. Um, now we're getting steady. East is pretty steady and he's pretty steady. You know, you start getting some knowledge in there. They start playing some high level softball. That's pretty fun to watch grow. So we're just in a different spot in our journey right now. Um, we're not replacing Josie by any means. I'm so excited to see her go on and do her thing, firefighting and all that. Um, now it's a chance for us to grow and watch someone else, you know, get those opportunities. And, um, I would say Torres, you know, is probably in the lead right now at the shortstop position. She's looking great. Um, She's, you know, coached well. Her dad coached her. It's kind of fun. She's got her sister playing at McNeese her senior year. So they are a softball family, and that's always fun to see grow. Well, you've always had new faces, whether it be freshmen or whoever, even if you have a veteran side that steps in and contributes right away. Like, I remember when Enfield first came on board, you are like, whoa, where does this kid come from? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Torres. Who are some of the new faces uh, that people might look at, keep an eye on, that could impact, could it contribute to your team in various ways? Yeah, um, I really like our freshman class in general. And, um, you know, I think that we're going to utilize a lot of our players early on just to, one, get their feet wet, two, you know, see how we sink in. Um, Jason E. Beecham is someone's playing third a little bit there with Kaylee Harding, and Jay is just swinging it. Um, she's just, uh, I just keep saying she's that Kirby Puckett to me, like just that 
that little, it's like she can hit, she can run, she can field it, you know, she just doesn't have the the normal frame at third that we usually have, like, um, but she she just gets it done and she's just such a joy to be around and um, I'm excited for her growth in the four years. Um, you know, I think Ashton Danley is someone that's going to roam around the outfield. She's going to pitch. She's going to hit. We've moved her to first base. We've had her a lot of different places. Um, she's got leadership in her, you know, she, it, she is a leader. She's going to be fun. She's, she loves playing softball. So she's going to be someone that I think people are going to be excited to, to watch grow. Um, I, Issa Torres, like I talked about in the middle, um, has got a good glove. Uh, Angelie Bueno has been getting after it. Kennedy Harp in the outfield. I mean, un godly strong that girl's so strong and um just hits the ball a mile um you know a lot of competition there in the outfield you like Janai Kerr mudges back way casers out there you got Katie Dax swinging it like so we're in a really good spot to let a lot of people mix in and out and play and kind of see where we are at the end of February on top of an amazing schedule we have a really competitive schedule so to be looking at yourself at the end of February, see who we have, see how we can get better against some of the best teams in the country is only going to be great for us. And we're, you know, I think we're all ready for that. Yeah, that's an understatement. Going to Oregon to play, you got what, Bama and Texas coming in. Uh, you're mm -hmm. opening up with Charlotte, by the way. That is, I mean, they, Coach Chastain's done a heck of a job there. They're an NCAA tournament team. That is a, uh, that's a marquee matchup opening yeah. night. So you're yeah. not doing your team any favors no. uh, at all. Is, is somebody on your staffs either say, what are you doing? Why are we like, you know, because that's you're, like I said, and then, you know, that, and that's not what I've been bringing up Clearwater. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, you know, I look at that Sunday night game against Tennessee at Clearwater playing UGA again, getting after UCLA, um, you know, Clearwater is going to be a good test for us. Uh, I think, you know, McNeese, Texas, Alabama here, are all great regional, super regional teams, um, World Series teams. Like we are going to get the gauntlet of really good offenses, really good pitching staffs, really speedy teams. Like, um, you know, again, we train for it in the fall, you know, to be challenged like this. And that is the only way we're going to grow. And, um, you know, I think that, you uh, for what we've always done pretty well is be able to keep in it, in it, in it, in it, in it, and then be able to make a run. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's the one thing that we've been talking about since September is like, can we take adverse situations and turn them into a positive? Can something be um, an outcome that we didn't want, but learn from it and turn it into something better for us down the line? And that has been our mindset all fall, um, just to be about, you know, only need everyone on this team. We only need everyone on this team to do what they need to do collectively and be present. And so now as we get into it and we got to turn around, and play a number five team and then the number two team and a number one pitching staff, like, so what be better, be better, be better. And uh, so we're prepped and ready for this, but yeah, it, it's going to be a, a super challenge in February. And I can't tell you our conference is legit too. I think Clemson's going to be awesome. You look at Vautech and what they're doing. Duke is not, you know, they, they got everyone returning plus some really good you know, new kids coming in. So um, you know, super exciting, really exciting to be able to to get after that kind of a schedule. Well, I, I joke, but I mean, many people would say that's your fault that the ACC has gotten stronger because yeah. <laughs> I've had ACC, like I said, I've had ACC coaches tell me, and you mentioned it, you winning that national title in 2018. We've said we've said this, but it, it really is underrated. You winning that national title gave belief to a lot of school programs and a lot of schools saying, "Hey, we could be, we could do it." If they, you know, they did it. I think. That helped, and I don't know if there's, there should be a documentary and, you know, worked in the works for that, because I think that contributed to, and John Rittman has said it, that, that you know, helped Clemson push, hey, let's push for softball and facilities. Yeah. We could do that at Duke, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, from that standpoint. But what does that mean you when people come up, and because that, that's that been a common thing that when I've talked to ACC coaches is that you winning the national title is the best thing that ever happened to ACC softball. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just really – I mean, I had, you know, opportunities at SEC schools and they had a, you know, administrators telling me I stay, I chose the wrong spot to stay because I couldn't win here, you know? And like, it's just fuel in your fire to be like, you can't tell me I can't do something, you know, like that no one should tell someone they can't do something, you know? And then when we actually did it, it, it raised the roof for 12, 13, 14 other schools, however big the conference is going to become. But like, now that many more student athletes get to play for something and they don't get to be relegated to a conference that can't win a championship. And so I just think, you know, when you play for something bigger, like we coach and play for something bigger, we want the game to grow. We want every person to be able to contribute and be able to make sure that they compete at the highest level. 
and you can in the ACC now. And, you know, we have Miami here. I had administrators from Miami here, you know, talking about facilities, ask me questions about coaching. Like, how do we get these programs to be that good? Like they have vested interest to step in this facility here and talk to me about how can we make Miami softball great? Like it is on the horizon. And that is so cool to be a part of that. So, you know, if we become all about ourselves, then the game doesn't grow in college. It doesn't grow internationally. It doesn't grow professionally. So we've really got to make sure that we keep pushing and sharing and growing in all areas. So very, you know, lots of pride in that sense and lots of pride that, you know, at Clemson's facility is amazing. Like, and they're getting tougher to recruit against, you know, and are there days where it was pretty easy to recruit in this conference? It was. Now it's not anymore. And we're going against everyone, which is great for the game, you know, but like on sometimes you're like, dang it. <laughs> you know? like, but I just think it's so cool to go play at these venues now. Um, you know, and and I know we had a team down here in postseason and they were very complimentary of our environment. And I think that's something that um I've always been really proud of is like. I don't think you always have to have the best, the glitter, the shiniest. You have to have an environment and people. And when your people believe in you and they love what they're doing and your environment is um, kind of dueling that, right? Like you can feel our fans because they love our players and it creates this really cool environment. Um, that's special. And, that you know, that's you want to play in front of that special place. And, you know, that team was in here for postseason and the coach is like, man, I want this. Like, how do you do this? And um, so when you got administration matching, we want softball and you got coaches wanting an environment and they build this special thing. Who doesn't want to be a part of that? Who doesn't want to be in those seats watching that? And that's where softball is right now. It's really, really cool. I'm glad you brought up your atmosphere. Cause right. You had like a big time attendance, uh, but people got to see that in the postseason, and, and, and it's kind of like people were like the media was big coverage over it. It, it reminded me because I grew up obviously following Florida state baseball, Mike Martin and the heyday and, and how it yeah. was always those atmosphere you're at that level now where yeah. everybody in that town is to a better word scrutinizing your program hey, if something if oh my god they lost again what's going on it, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of an but it's a good problem to have because yeah. people care more now than ever before about your program have you sensed yeah. that oh, in, yeah. from the community yeah yeah you go in a grocery store now and you can hear people say oh that's a softball coach you know and i'm like <laughs> that's so cool you know as i'm wearing my flip flops and my hair is in a bun you know and you're like dang it but like Honestly, to recognize softball, like we've become a part of the family here in the community here. And that's special for our players. You know, they know that they have the support. They know when they get done with the game, they have people here that care about them. Like it's just become a very cool atmosphere on that sense. And I think that's special about, you know, college town too, you know, that people are all in for it. So, you know, there's a little niche on that side, but you're right. Like, I mean, the Martins were amazing, you know, amazing people, you know, you got to know them as people and then, you know, as coaching staffs for their kids. And I see that with Link going on right now. Norvell's the same way. Even my office mate over here, Brian Penske, winning a championship in soccer. Like there's just such a really cool family feel with coaches and players and, and everyone involved. And so um, to try to make sure we have that connection with our fan base is, is very important to us. And that's why the facility upgrades mm -hmm. that you've made and will make are important because yeah. now you're 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 an event. People want to go have a good night, bring their kids, bring families. Yeah. They're going to come to your ballpark. So for those that maybe haven't followed it closely, give an update on the, the on your facilities because I know there's been an ongoing adding stuff and and still yeah. more plans. Yeah, that's probably the other area that everyone's trying to fight for is just more seating and college softball in general. And um, you know, I. I go back and forth. Like it's nice to have these nice big stadiums built, but sometimes they're away from the campus. You know, we're lucky because we're on campus. I love that. We're right next to soccer. We're right next to football. Like you can hear the band practicing every day, which you know always gives me chills because that's very collegiate to me, you know? And um, so, but when you're in those little landlocked areas, you can't have the big stadiums and the big, you know, you're not getting six, 10, 15,000 seats, you know? So um, but we do have a parking garage. We do have a street. We do have areas that people can bring lawn chairs in and sit down and and make it a venue. And that's the thing that is really cool is at 8 a.m. in the morning, they're lined up, you know, to make sure that they can get their seats and and get in here. So I think that's been a, a lot of the special part of what this atmosphere has created and kind of the Wrigleyville feel out there, you know, when they're up and they're, they pull their trucks in, they sit in their trucks, you know, in the parking garage. And it's like they're up on the apartment buildings, you know, in Chicago. It's kind of cool. You mentioned Miami, obviously. They're, they're looking into putting in a softball program. 
uh, at some point down in Coral Gables, which somebody who grew up in Miami, I'm like, where have you been? Oh, stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, hey, join the party. Uh, but I'm curious from your standpoint, because you like, like I said, you, the schedule speaks for you. You always schedule tough non-conference. But I've had coaches tell me that right now it's tough scheduling future non-conference because of all that's going on in college athletics with realignment. Obviously, the ACC no, uh, no, no different. You have the added part of perhaps more teams being added, like a Miami, perhaps down the road and stuff. How is that affecting you future scheduling-wise? Is it more difficult because you maybe have more, you have limited dates than you had before. How give us the process from a scheduling a non-conference? Because I think that's an underrated story when talking about all these conferences growing. It does. There's a rippling effect. Yeah, yeah. I, huh, I don't know. It's hard for us because we're in the southeast, you know. So we get a lot of really good mid majors. So we get a lot of good power five. Everyone's trying to figure out what that right RPI scheduling is. A little bit KPI has been talked about as of late on road or home scheduling. So everyone's trying to figure it out. But in the end, wins, wins matter. You know, you got to get wins. And so um, so when you're looking at SEC, depending on what kind of schedule you get in the SEC, um, they're definitely tough. And week in and week out, they're going to have a tough schedule. So they got to figure out how where they're at as programs. And depending on that scheduling, you look at some mid-majors, they want to go get challenged, but they also want to make sure that they can get, you know, pretty high RPI to give themselves that opportunity to get in or, you know, being at large there. So, um, so everyone's got to be really good about the scheduling piece. And I think it's knowing your team at the time and, you know, how you can keep your, your program moving in the direction of where you want to go. Is it conference championship? Is it super regionals? Is it world series? Like everyone's got to figure out where to, to place themselves. So I think for Miami, you know, I mean, um, you're in a great spot where you can host teams. Everyone's going to want to come play in some sunshine. We've got lucky at that too, right? You look at February, you're going to get some good teams down here. You're going to be able to go play some teams because people can't play up in the cold weather. And so that's always been a benefit on our side. Um, and then the tournaments like ESPN Clearwater, like, like they give us great opportunities, what the Mary Nutter does for people on the West coast. So, so those tied into, then you get good relationships with people like Texas, like Mike White has always been good at like, I want to play a schedule like we play. And he goes out there, Tim Walton and I have a really good relationship. We always play. Alabama has been really good at always playing. So there's a, like, generational coaches, I think that are like, man, let's just go play. Let's just put it to the test. And then you got some that are very strategy oriented, you know? So, um, so for me, Miami's going to be in a good spot because they're going to be at a really good conference that's going to help them. They're going to be in the sun, sunshine, so that's going to help them, you know, and they're going to be in um, the growing part, right? So they go in strategy-wise, like, how are we going to grow in the, the five years to get to where we want to get to? And that always becomes a lot of fun. Careful. Don't give them away. Don't give away everything to them. Come on. You make <laughs> your life more difficult here. Uh, two last things. Yeah. You've obviously made a lot of contributions to the game, uh, you know, internationally, collegially, pro. Uh, it's worth pointing out, by the way, you're not you, you have no desire to retire anytime soon. Like, I, and I think that we got to bring that up because it's weird, right? Like you're in the Hall of Fame. Usually when people get into the Hall of Fame, it's towards the end of a career. That, that is not the case with you. So let's just. No. Clear. All right. No. Good. Yeah. What do you want to it, it contribute? What do you think is the next thing you want to help the game in, in in contributing? Whether it's a rule, something in the collegiate game, something. What do you think needs to be addressed that you want to maybe contribute and help solve an answer or add something to the game moving mm. forward? Because you've done a lot of that stuff throughout in your various uh, involvement in the game. What's yeah. next that needs to be addressed? Yeah. Wow. Eric, you're really getting to some things. I, I think um, probably two things is uh, one, we need to speed up the game and we need to figure out how to do it. Like baseball's doing it, you know, so we need to be better at um, figuring out, like, I think for a while everyone's like, oh, well, we don't really need TV. Like we do need TV and we need to make a TV a piece and we need to figure out how to get in that two hour, two hour and 10 minute window. We need to understand the big business of softball. Like, what is the big business of getting on TV? How does it help us grow? Because we are not, we could sell out our two, three, 4,000 seat stadiums and still not make the money. So we just need to be real with that. And that, and I think speeding up the game keeps, that. that's our niche, right? We're a fast paced game. We're a lot of fun to be around. We got good energy and we're two and a half hours and not three to four hours, right? So, so that piece, we're talking about it as a coaching uh, conference, which is awesome. And just trying to implement that. So that's something to talk about. Two is recruiting uh, calendar. Um, I've been on the recruiting calendar for many years. Um, 
we need to we need to take care of the health of our kids when they get to college. More and more college kids now are enduring injuries um, because they're they're playing a stressful game at 10U and 12U. Like not playing softball. You can play softball 10, 12, 14U and play free and have fun, or you could be stressed and playing 70, 80 games and thinking that you're trying to impress coaches and you're trying to impress coaches on social media and you're trying to do all these things at a very youthful, innocent time in your life. And we need to figure out how to, to manage that piece. And, and I don't know what it is, you know, we've talked about it a lot too, but um, you know, there's a lot more arm injuries. There's a lot more back injuries. There's a lot more just overuse injuries happening and um, great. Everybody wants to go out and be the best they can be, but is there a way that we could do it to where we can build in some rest or build in some mental health moments to like, let them check out, play some other sports, do some things to, to continue to keep the health of our game. And so um, something that we've been throwing around quite a bit and trying to understand. So willing to be a part of those conversations have been a part of them and definitely trying to help any way we can. That's good. I like those two, especially number two. I think that's a very important just for society in general. I, I yeah. think that's very important. This is where the je broadcasting games with Jessica Burroughs is going to come in and play here because she's influenced me because I'm going to defend pitchers. And she would has told me this. All for the pitch clock, but let's get those batters in the box quickly, too. Yep. Let's, it's a two-way street. Let's yep. not pick on the pitchers. Now, I, I'm guilty. I'm a little homerist. I'm a little biased towards pitchers. So yep. I'm always defensive when it comes to pitch clocks being brought up. And yep. again, working with Burroughs uh, enhanced that. So yep. blame her. But I do think, and, and Coach Wall even brought this up when I had him on recently about the batter's box coming in, because that's been part of the international game. Yep. The international game's great. And, you know, I think there's a lot, like, one, we could call pitches in better. Like our process of calling in pitches takes way too long. Like we, we got to be quicker in there. They've got to, you know, we got to get the hitters in the box. Like baseball's doing it right now. You know, baseball's getting in the box timeout. They're doing it with like the inability to pick people off. Like they're taking away strategies to make the game faster and we're still staying where we're at. So we just got to look at all angles of it to make it better. But I agree a foot in the box can be fine. You know, we've done it internationally and the 22nd clock internationally. I mean, the game goes fast and it's athletic. And, you know, it's, it comes to the point where you just let your kids play um, versus us, us trying to manage every piece of it and be a part of every piece as a coach. Like, man, it's almost like hockey, like fly in, fly out, fly in, fly out. Like it's, it's, you know, fast, but you're letting them play. And then what we do in the training time, Monday through Friday, let them play Monday through Friday, we can train them and then just let them play, you know? So anyways, um, definitely think there can be some cool assets to that. Do you like 20 seconds? Do you think that's the right number uh, yep. to throw there? And then I know they also, the NCAA modified the illegal pitch. Yeah. Uh, there was some, did you like that? Uh, what yeah. they did? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if we can take away, I mean, I was a part of the Vautech, you know, illegal pitch fiasco that happened here against us and that weekend they were here. And um, I just like, not all umpires are educated on the pitching part of it, nor should they be. And then when we have them getting ticky tack on that, and then it takes away, it makes a mockery of the game. And I think the offense is great right now. And, um, you know, if we can just let the pitchers pitch, you know, let them do what they want to do, figure it out. Like the hitters will figure it out. Like we can continue to grow and evolve there. So, um, so I'm a big fan of it. I like to keep my foot down. Like that's just me personally, but I don't care what other people want to do. You know, I just, I think we just need to open it up a little bit more and, um, technology is becoming such a big part of our game. Replay is becoming a big part of our game. So if we add replay and technology in and then having ticky tack, our game's going to slow down so much. And, um, uh, like, I don't even want replay in our game because to me, it slows it down and I just rather play it, but you know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. So we got to go for it. We got to figure out how to, to keep that speed going, but have those as components of it. That's true. We could spend another hour on that, but we'll save you that could. for next year for our 10 year <laughs> yeah. anniversary show. Yes, you got uh, it. <laughs> on that last question before I let yeah. you go. When you get to February, you can open with Charlotte, very marquee tournament right off the bat opening in Clearwater. What are some questions you have about your team and keys you're looking forward to finding out playing those games that you don't know by in in, in scrimmages? You're going to find out yeah. playing other opponents that will be keys to the rest of the season. Yeah, I think um, one, super excited. We got Charlotte. We have Texas Tech coming in too. Yeah, you're so we Craig, Craig Snyder. Craig Snyder, yeah, and Bryce Tukulve who played and Morgan Claveman who played here. Uh, Pedro is a manager. So Texas Tech is going to be special for us that weekend too. But um, I think um, really by the end of February, I want to feel really good about our ability to lead through tough times. You know, our ability to, 
to on the field, they can look at each other and get through some tough times, some tough innings, whatever it might be, the challenges that, that we can get after that. So good, solid leadership consistently, not just the highs, you know, during some of the lows too. Um, I'd really like to see some maturity start to show up in our circle. You know, I think that uh, we're going to get the opportunities to grow as pitchers in the circle. And so like, but can we be a little more mature, you know, by the end and, and a little bit more um, taking control versus just pitching? We're going to be pitching in February. Then are we taking control of pitching, you know, towards the end of February? So those are kind of the two things that I think are going to be big for us. And then honestly, the end of February is when we sit down as a staff and we really start to like really look into what works for us. So that's when we start to make some changes as a coaching staff of what we're going to sell out for. So that's always the fun time as a coaching staff is to gather around the table and like really throw our ideas out of how we want to play the game, because this is what Team 41 is. Um, so we usually know by then what that looks like. It's Florida State head coach Lonnie Alameda, Hall of Fame. Mer head coach Lonnie Alameda. It's a good title added. Congrats. Well Thank deserved you. on that. Uh long overdue there. Congrats. Thank you for always coming on. Like I said, it's our yearly tradition. Yeah. Uh you're and we always enjoy your candor and your great thoughts on the game because obviously your your opinions matter in the sport and helps mm -hmm. the game grow. Uh, thanks for always doing this. You don't have to, but you choose to uh deal with me on a yearly basis. So thank you for that. And I'll see you uh, during the season. Sounds wonderful. Thank you too, Eric. Take care.